I'm James O'Keefe. I'm the Marketing Technology Director at Legal & General. Um, Legal & General are a coffee shop startup from about 180 years ago where a group of lawyers got together and decided that if they pooled risk, they'd be able to deliver better outcomes for the, the people that were unfortunate to lose um, a loved one. So it was that kind of... Uh, you know, the, the greater good, the, the purposeful business that was formed 180 years ago has gone through a number of transformations. Um, the latest transformation is something that I've been involved with for the last five years. I've got Gareth in the room as well, one of my colleagues. Um, we're on a journey, right? So we're not done. This is a big journey that we're continuing now. Um, but for context, we have a direct business that's about 20% of our overall business. So most of our business is written through partners and intermediaries. Um, the difference being is that if you write business through a partner or intermediary, when you get a bit of business, you pay them a commission. So it's a contra-revenue business model. It works really, really well. When you're doing things direct, as many of you will know, you're having to make a marketing investment and then try and derive value from that marketing investment. If you get that wrong, you can waste an awful lot of money. Um, GDPR was our big mandate for change because it hit us hard. So we, we used to rely heavily on third-party data. We used to do a lot of DM around life events and all, we could buy audiences that were really in the market for our products and GDPR really hit us hard so it, it really hit our commercial model. It gave us an opportunity though to really think about how we could start to use first party data and what our marketing technology stack looked like. Um, so that's the first thing in, in any transformation journey, what's your problem and what's the opportunity that you are trying to solve for? It's really important as as Hugh said, you start with a, a kind of a what and a why, and maybe a high-level version of, of when, not specific detailed you know, milestones that you want to push on a team, but what are we going to achieve? Why are we doing this? It's really important to get that vision out there before we think about how, where, and who. And for anyone that might be slightly offended by the disgusting-looking picture there, that is beyond meat. It's not actually real meat. It's the, um, it's the, the wonderful faux meat. Um, but that, that represents the sausage factory for us that broke. Second big problem was a lot of people, and you, you know, many of you work with data, so you'll know how awkward and difficult it can be, but many of our senior stakeholders used to use that phrase at the top, which drove me wild. Can't you just... We've got all this data. Can't you just do X, Y, and Z? Isn't it just a case... It's easy as. Can't you just go and buy some tech and fix it all? Um, and, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. So for us, we spent most of our time not just thinking about the, the tech or the data, but about people and process. So it was really important for us that we lent into some of the policies, lent into our data protection people, lent into our conduct risk people, lent into legal people to say, actually, how do we understand the policies the business operates within? What are the permissions that we have? What are the consents? What does that look like? Are we consistent in the way we write consents across our business? Lots of different um, you know, silos within the business existed. And finally, preferences as well. That's another big piece that, you know, when not just thinking about marketing here, but engagement in general. How do we think about how customers want to deal with us and what, what needs they have? Um, so for us, thinking about governance was really important. This is, you know, for us, it's, it's really about thinking about who produces the data and who consumes it. So it's thinking about data as a product, thinking about the different audiences for that data, whether it's the end user, the consumer, or the internal audiences. That was a really important part of our journey to map that out. Essentially, we took a wall as big as this and took some of our journeys and basically started to, to map through the different technology that we had, the different data that was created, where it was used, how it was used. And that was really the, the, the essence of that journey and data audit that we had to give us a sense of what opportunities we had. And Hugh sort of ended his presentation saying, you know, you can do things small, you can do things simple, you can probably do things with the data you've already got. So before you go out and think you have to do something completely different... You can probably, from that initial data journey audit, really truly understand some of the quick wins and opportunities you have. And we did that. But there are lots of different stakeholders to engage. And I don't know if many of you have heard about the five blind men and the elephant. It's a parable from Asia. Um, but five, and I need to say five, because often I'll do this and I'll only refer to four. So five things, tusks, ears, trunk, leg, tail. That's five things, isn't it? If you've got one blind man with a tusk, he thinks it's pointy and like a spear. If you've got one blind man with a trunk, he thinks it's long and like a, a, a snake. One blind man with an ear, he thinks it's a, a, it's a big sheet, it's a big rug. One with a leg, he thinks it's a tree trunk. The one with the tail thinks it's a piece of rope. 
Without context, they're all right. Without context, they're all thinking about the thing that they're obsessed about. They're not looking at the bigger picture. They're not looking at the animal, the elephant. They're all describing the same thing, but they're all describing different things. So it's really important as you build you know, the, the stakeholders, the internal stakeholders that you've got, they all understand what you're trying to achieve and why you're doing it. That's, that's crucially important in any journey. You have to share that vision. So without that purpose, vision, goals, you're going to create an awful lot of noise as people try and seek their own context and create their own meaning to what, what you're trying to achieve. You can't eat an elephant in one sitting is the, is the expression, but you know, it is about delivering your goals in increments. So for us, we adopted agile methodologies, but it was more about the mindset. That was the most important thing. Without focus and prioritization, you're going to end up with 101 things you could do, but you've got to try and find the 10 things that are going to make the biggest difference for your business, and even then, focus and prioritize it again. So you're going to look for the things that are going to have the biggest impact on your internal customers or the external consumer. And it's really, really crucially important that you find out who's going to actually help you get this done. So it's building that coalition of the willing. Um, and, and these are a set of KPIs that, that, well, KPIs as we think of them, keeping people inspired, so sharing that vision and goals, keeping people involved, how do you empower the teams to get stuff done, keeping people informed, how do you create that transparency, and keeping people interested, how do you share the results and your learnings and the failures? Because you might you know, set out your vision about achieving that big, hairy, scary goal in five years' time, but you're not going to do everything in one go. You're going to have to find the thing, you know, where are you going to be in three months' time, where are you going to be in six months' time? What things are you going to need to achieve in those shorter cycles of, of incremental experiments and loops as you go? So for us, it was crucially important that we adopted Agile to deliver in increments. Um, Hugh ended by talking about almost the sort of multimedia attribution. And we have, we started with using segmentation in a very descriptive way. So we would look at the customers we wrote to our book. We'd look at the... 10 million different relationships we'd had. We'd classify them using our, our, C, our CACI segmentation. We've got a custom version of the segmentation. And we'd always look backwards to go, well, what have we written? What have we done? How can we use that to inform our audiences going forward? That feedback loop wasn't fast enough. So for us, in about two and a half years ago, we spoke with Cara and we said, right, we need to be able to segment customers further up the funnel. So not just customers, not just policyholders. We need to get further up the funnel to people who are engaging with us and quoting. How can we segment at that point? So we, need, we need to understand more about the people that don't convert as much as the people that do convert. So we, we've leveraged the real-time API for the last couple of years. We've built up hundreds of thousands of customer profiles, both of converters and non-converters. And we've used that in combination with all our first-party internal data to create really rich profiles of customers. And it's helped us build out that, that pathway and the, the thing you see on the right there of, of you know, a, a view on the, the, the first bar chart is if we looked at first touch, you know, what would that look like? If we looked at last touch, you know, you're going to see the big orange bar there is the sort of low cost, no cost, lead nurture type activities. And the, the, the thing on the right shows the, the sort of mark of um, a probabilistic view, the multimedia attribution that says, what's the role of the different channels online and offline together? And what does that do to our interpretation of, of which marketing channels are most effective? So that's been a big part of our journey to get to that point now where we have all of the data to make that kind of decision. It's not an easy journey to get to that point, but it is a journey that is worthwhile undertaking because it's, it's helped us to drive about 15% improvement in marketing effectiveness. So we've been able to recycle some of those budgets back into new marketing investment. We know where to spend the next best marketing pound. We know the potential value of prospects and we know where we can target those prospects best, uh, where we're going to get the strongest conversion rates. And most importantly, we're not just a multi-channel business anymore. We're now omni-channel because we can connect between the sort of online to offline and back again. And that's all using small MVPs as we've built, but small MVPs to build out that connection between all of our first-party data to enrich it with valuable third-party data, because third-party data, although it's been under pressure, there's still valuable, sort of, you know, tip to CACI here, but there's still valuable enrichment we can do of our first-party data that gives us even more um, you know, intelligent ways of understanding who our segments are and how we can target and activate against them. So I think the final, thing I'd, final point I'd sort of leave you on is if some of this stuff sounds exciting to you, 
There's plenty of people in the room that are doing it, done it, have got the ideas. So use your network, use CACI, use the expert. There's plenty of people out there that can help you find out what those first experiments would be um, for you to run in your business. So share the problem, share the opportunity, use your network. There's loads of people out there who are on the journey that, that we've been on and, and you'll be on yourselves.